Every Sunday, when it is time to open up the Word of God, I, I do so with the recognition that I cannot say anything that is going to have a lasting impact in your life. I, I, I can be as creative as I can. I can, I can study the Word of God. I can pour my life into the Scriptures. I can, I can know the Greek. I can do all of the stuff that a pastor is supposed to do to prepare for a message. I can, I can pray like I've never prayed before. But when I stand before you, I do so with a recognition that if, the, if God does not send his Holy Spirit to intersect what it is that comes out of my mouth and he places it in your heart, if the Holy Spirit doesn't do what only the Holy Spirit can do, we are gathering for a bunch of people to listen to a guy talk. That's all we're doing. Normally, I come before you with that frame of mind. But on a morning like today, I, I am even more aware of the reality that, that we need the Holy Spirit to, to pour into our heart, into our mind, into our congregation, and, and intersect the space between heaven and earth, intersect the space between, between our heart and mind, and and the message that God would have for us. I'm, I'm aware of that today. I, I pray almost every morning in this sanctuary. I, if I'm not in here, I pray elsewhere, but almost every morning I get in here. And this week I struggled to, to type uh, the message because I, I kept coming back to pray, to prayer. I, I could not get out of the out of the out of the mode of prayer because I know that when you talk about the issue of forgiveness, it requires the Holy Spirit. We cannot be made aware of our need for the transforming work of the Holy Spirit to forgive us of our sins if the Holy Spirit does not come by His grace and make us aware of our need for Him. We cannot come to a place where we recognize our need for forgiveness without the Holy Spirit first taking a step toward us. So I can type all I want this week. I could study all I want this week, and I did those things, but I prayed like I have never prayed for a message, recognizing that if anyone is going to respond to the forgiving grace of God, It'll, it, it'll be in direct relation to the Holy Spirit calling you by name and saying there is something in your heart that I want to do today. Now, some of you might hear some very familiarity, a, a, a similarity to other sermons that I've preached, and so why preach it again? It is because between the last time that I spoke about forgiveness and repentance and this time when I'm speaking about forgiveness and repentance, it could be that the Holy Spirit has worked in you. It could be that the Holy Spirit working in me will cause me to say a sentence that captures your heart and mine. It could be that you were not at a place when the Holy Spirit had moved you to a place where you were ready to respond in obedience. This, this message is is important to repeat, and repeat often. So if you are sitting in your seat this morning, and your conscience is clear before the Lord, you are walking in obedience, I'd encourage you to listen, but I would also encourage you to pray. That you would join me in the prayer that the Holy Spirit would intersect us today and help us in our worship. We continue from last week and our conversation about King David. Uh, so if you've not already uh, done so, I had posted it in, um, on Facebook, and it was also the, uh, the, the text for the devotional this morning that we send out each day. 
But if you've not already turned to Psalm 51, I'd encourage you to do so. If you don't know where it is, we will have it on the screen for you. The 51st Psalm. David writes these words, and your Bible is probably like mine in that it says, it is a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. In other words, this is David's prayer after Nathan called him out on his sin, his adultery. We read these words. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar." David had been discovered. He thought that he had gotten away with his sin. He thought that no one knew. He thought that he had navigated the troubled waters that he had created for himself, born out of this rebellion. And yet then God sends the prophet Nathan, and the prophet says, David, you have sinned against me. You're the man. And we have in this passage today the prayer of David in response to his being discovered. Have mercy on me, O God. Cleanse me. Purge me. Wash me. In the church in America today, we need repentance more than ever. We, we need to rediscover the spiritual importance of repentance. We, we know the devastating impact that a lack of genuine sorrow has in the life of a person. We see it in our children all the time. I have M&Ms in an M&M dispenser in my office to hand to children. Sometimes I rotate it two or three times and give kids more than their hands will hold, and then they put it in their mouths and go to grab the twisty thing because they want some more. And their parent says, no, you've had enough. Then comes the moment. <laughs> With their hand on the spinny thing, if I just turn this, I can get more M&Ms. And the parent says, no. Well, a kid that gets punished but still gets a few more M&Ms probably isn't going to regret it too much. 
They might regret that they got punished, but man, do those M&Ms taste good. And they do taste good. We've got a lot of folks that, that are kind of sorry, uh, but not, not sorry enough to repent. Repentance is a thorough change of mind in regards to sin. It is a genuine sorrow that, that looks at one's life and says, I cannot live like this anymore. I cannot engage in this activity anymore. It is, it is a thorough disgust with the activity and the behavior that is holding you spiritually captive. It is, it is the declaration to God, I cannot tolerate this activity anymore. I cannot tolerate this rebellion anymore. I cannot tolerate this sin anymore. If I am going to have a thorough change of mind. I need your spirit, Father, to bring me to a place of repentance so that I can experience this thorough change of mind in regards to sin. I can change what it is that's been going on in my life. And we need to rediscover, reaffirm, and declare at the top of our voices that the power of Jesus Christ who lived a sinless life, died a sinless death, death, and rose victoriously on the third day, conquering sin and hell, has the power over sin in our life. We are shortchanging the gospel of Jesus because we act like that everything is okay. Brothers and sisters, we cannot bring people to a place of repentance if everybody's okay. It started with a, a quaint bumper sticker, and if you have it on your car, forgive me, you might want to take it off. I'm not perfect, just forgiven. If you have that on there, just hide it from me, because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be disappointed. I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Now. One, it minimizes forgiveness, because I'm just forgiven. And two, it, it infers that God is okay with rebellion. We cannot come to Jesus and say, I am only sorry insofar as I will follow you in this area of my life and reject you in this area of my life. I'm going to love you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and and Saturday, I'm going to treat you like garbage, Miriam. Yeah, God likes that. We, we can't say, okay, God, I'll follow you by, by not engaging in these behaviors. But you know what? I'm not perfect, just forgiven, so I'll, 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 I'll just negotiate with you on these. That then has created the... Nobody is allowed to say anything that the Bible says is sin, because that's judging. And since nobody is allowed to say anything about sin, God doesn't have a problem with sin anymore. You just define what is righteousness. Brother and sister, God has defined righteousness, and it's in the person of Jesus. So I don't get to come to him and only be sorry enough to say, okay, God, if you reveal this to me, I'll say yes. But if you re reveal this to me, I'll say no. Just give me enough of you so I can get to heaven. Have mercy on me, O oh God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, I beg with you, Father, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my guilt. It is the cry of David that screams out to the Father, I am lost if you don't come into my heart and life and purify my heart from unrighteousness to set me free from the law of sin and death. I am hopeless before you. And our world is out there telling you everybody's okay. We've turned into American universalists whereby God in his love, is, is no longer holy, no longer has expectations for repentance. I'm not saying that, that Christians won't make mistakes. I am not saying that Christians can't sin. I am not saying that you are immune from mistakes. I am not saying that you can't sin. 
but I have yet to meet a healthy marriage relationship whereby the husband and wife woke up this morning, looked at each other, and said, I wonder how I'm going to hack you off today. Why do we do that with God? This is a passionate relationship of love whereby the God who created me has sent his son to die for me, to purify me of all unrighteousness, to set me free from the law of sin and death, to set me free from the bondage of all that hell seeks to place in my life. The Father has come in the person of Jesus, and he, he, he empowers me by the Holy Spirit to live with with this love relationship with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we're short selling the gospel and it's breaking God's heart. Is it any wonder why our neighbors find Christianity unattractive? It's because we've got a fish sticker on the back of our car while we flip people off when they hack us off in the car. Do you know how many times I've heard that this week? We get out and yell and scream and swear and they see our logo on the back, church logo on the back of a car. We don't have those yet, but we will. Don't put it on there if you're going to represent Jesus poorly. I've spent a ton of time on this point of the message. This is the reason why I've prayed. If anyone is going to come to understand that they have been sold a cheap understanding of grace, if anyone is going to come to believe that they have compromised in faith, if anyone is going to come to believe that they have, they have, they're in this relationship with God and, and we're in this negotiation, well, I'll take this sin but not that sin. Forgive me of this sin but don't pay attention to this one. And as long as I get to heaven, folks, when, when we repent, he makes us a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and it's a gift from Jesus. Repentance results in new creation. Have you repented of your sin? Has he made you into a new creation in Christ? The old is gone, the new has come. If we don't believe this, then, then why in the world did Jesus come? The scriptures are filled with the declaration that if we continue in sin, if we continue in rebellion, if we continue to knowingly violate the relationship with God, we have neither seen him nor known him. Now, I'm not telling you this to make you feel guilt or to condemn. I'm telling you because I believe that there is a relationship with Jesus that so transforms our life that we fall in love with him like we've never fallen in love with him, that the resurrection power of Jesus comes on to humans and he allows us to live in this passionate transformed relationship with Jesus. I believe in that. And I believe it in enough to look you in the eye and say that you can have something better with Jesus. We may go a little long today. Verse 3 and 4. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. There are some folks in our sanctuary this morning that have come to a place where they have, they have found forgiveness. And, and as we mentioned last week, the enemy of your soul keeps hammering you with it. He keeps hammering you with it. He keeps telling you that, that, that God can't use you, that, that you're worthless, that, that, that you're less than a, a Christian should be. And, and you think on it. You think back to the decisions that you've made. You think back to the, to the destructive choices that you've made. And you think about the ongoing effects of the sin that, that existed in your life. Brother and sister, uh, you need to find yourself to where David was. My sin is ever before me. Yes, I, that is true. But, but he found a place of freedom. You, you have to forgive yourself. 
you have, to, you have to come to a place where you forgive yourself from your past. If you don't, you are elevating your authority for forgiveness above God's. God has the power to forgive. And when I refuse to forgive myself, I am placing my authority to forgive above his. We need to let his authority to forgive supersede our authority to forgive so that his forgiveness becomes our forgiveness, that we forgive ourselves like God has forgiven ourselves. Folks, there are some in the sanctuary that need to be set free by the Holy Spirit to forgive themselves. You cannot live on the bondage of the pain of your past when God has forgiven it, when God has forgotten it. You can come to a place of spiritual freedom as well. We need to forgive ourselves, just like God has forgiven us. Then we need to come to believe in the possibility of restoration. Verses 10 to 13 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then... Then, then, let's go back. Then, how did we get to then? Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit, cast me not away, take not your Holy Spirit, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Some of you need to come to terms with the issue of restoration. There are two typical errors when it comes to restoration. The first is the belief that we are not worth restoring. Well, if, if you're worth dying for, I'm pretty sure you're worth restoring. If you're worth dying for, you are worth restoring. There's a tweet for you. Jesus Christ did not die from your sin, die for your sin, to set you free from the law of sin and death so you could live in misery. That is not the good news that Jesus came to proclaim. Jesus came to proclaim that if we are free, we are free. And some of you need to come to conclude that you know what? The forgiveness of Jesus Christ is all that it is cracked up to be, that the forgiveness of Jesus can meet my needs, and I am worth something to Jesus. So if I'm worth something, something to Jesus, then I must be worth something. God still can use me. God still can guide me. I still can make a difference in my neighbor's life. I still can make a difference in my co-worker's life. I still can make a difference in my neighbor's life, and I will not let anyone look at me with less love or less dignity than Jesus. Jesus himself looks at me. Don't let them do it. The second error is a rush to restoration. It is the quick prayer. Okay, God, make it clean and you know, teach me everything you need to teach me in the next three minutes so I can go back to the way things were. Well, that might work if... Uh, if sin didn't affect people. But sin often affects people. It is, it is in submitting to the process of recreation that God restores us. Look at David's prayer. It is a prayer of recreation so that God would restore him. Create in me. He had a clean heart. Now he's praying it again. It is the recreation of a clean heart. He, he had a right spirit. This is the man that refused to submit to the authority systems that would have caused him when he was anointed king to go take over for Saul. He refused to live according to the systems of his day. He had a right spirit, and yet he lost it. Now it needs recreated. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. I I have, I have made my life impure, and I need you to purify my heart and life. Don't cast me away. Restore to me the joy of salvation. There is a psychological process that we often have to go through to rediscover joy. And David knew that, that he had to go through this process of restoration in order to come to a place whereby he could teach 
transgressors again. There is a process to restoration, and it must not be rushed. Must not be rushed. I had a friend who we had a, my wife and I had a great relationship with them. We still have a great relationship with him. She was like a sister that I never had. We loved spending time with this couple. The Lord has only really come to me with clear messages about something related to specific people on just two or three occasions in pastoral ministry. The Lord came to me about her and said, you need to have a conversation with her. Someone's after her. And I sat down with her and I I said, someone's after you. Pastor, you're nuts. About a month later, um, the Lord came to me again and said, you need, to, you need to say the exact same thing to her. So I sat down with her again, just her and me. I said, someone's after you. Pastor, you're nuts. The Lord came to me again and said, you need to tell her again. And I sat down with her and I said, I'm sorry to offend you, but I, I just can't get away from this. Someone's after you. Pastor, you're nuts. A month later, they were both in my living room sobbing at the discovery that she had committed adultery. I asked her to pray a prayer of repentance, and it was the most pathetic prayer I'd ever heard in my life. It was so pathetic that I opened up Psalm 51, hoping that the Holy Spirit would come and and do what only the Holy Spirit through the Word of God could do. And she read the prayer, and it, it was the most lifeless reading of Scripture that I'd ever heard. She went and found a church that told her that it is okay to commit adultery, to continue to commit adultery, to leave your husband and go with the other guy and things are cool with Jesus in that relationship. I don't want to be that church on Judgment Day. And I'm definitely not going to be the pastor that shortchanges the gospel. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ can transform a repentant heart. He can help you come to a place where you forgive yourself. He can restore you. He can restore the joy of your salvation. He can restore your heart and life. He can restore you today. This morning... Out under our drive through I don't know what entrance you came in, but we are going to have the most unusual altar call that I've ever performed or offered. Last week, for those of you that were with us, know that we had a line of people up front that came and wrote about their need for grace or celebrating grace. It was a beautiful moment in our sanctuary. Lines of people came forward and placed their grace moments on, on boards that were in the sanctuary. Well, this morning, out those back doors, out the front door, just in the grass of the drive through is a fire. One of our lay people are already there making sure it's burning. Some of us need to believe that we can be restored. 
Some of us need to believe that because of our repentant heart, God has forgiven you and you need to forgive yourself. And as much as those two things are important, it is the prayer of my heart today that the Holy Spirit would intersect a heart, a mind, a life. Somebody would come down here I sinned. I need Jesus. I need to repent, whatever it is. And for whomever comes and writes anything on this piece of paper today, we'd encourage you to walk out the sanctuary. Right from here, don't wait until the benediction, right from here, walk out there. And so, Curtis, if you'll go ahead and open that back door for me, brother. Just go throw it in the fire and come back. The whole, this will be the longest altar I've ever celebrated in pastoral ministry. But Jesus will meet you here. Jesus will meet you as you walk. Jesus will meet you outside the front doors. It's already burning. Father, I believe there are some folks who are here today who need to come to a place of repentance. And as I've been praying all week long, this is just a talk if the Holy Spirit doesn't come to us. It is the recitation of words in Scripture if the Holy Spirit does not bring them life. So, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would give somebody the courage today to come to these tables, to write what it is that you have placed on their heart to write, to walk out the sanctuary doors to that fire and drop it in and say, I believe Jesus, the power of Jesus has more power than my sin. I repent today. Others, Father, will come forward and just write down something like, I need to forgive myself. Will you help me, Jesus? And they're going to go out there to that fire as a symbol of their belief that you can help them in their forgiving themselves. I believe that there might be some folks here today that need to come forward and say, I need, Father, to believe that you can restore my heart. Will you stand with me? We're going to close in singing a song. If the Lord is asking you to come, come and write down whatever it is you feel led. Take it out, throw it in the fire, come back. today cried out to you and say, Father, I repent of my sin. I pray as this service comes to its close that your Holy Spirit would testify to their spirit that they are your son, they are your daughter. You have heard their cry of repentance. Their sins have been washed white as snow. You do not remember their past anymore. As far as the east is from the west, so their transgressions are far removed from you, so far removed from them. They are a new creation today. 
The person that walked in this sanctuary is not the person that's walking out of this sanctuary. They are a new creation in Jesus Christ, and they leave today in the victory of knowing that you who saved them, you are the God who will help them grow in their love, and you will keep them from the evil one. For the one who needs to forgive themselves, I pray that the, that the peace of your Holy Spirit would wash over their heart and mind, that the anxiousness would wash away, the turmoil would be gone, and the peace of your Holy Spirit would wash over them. For the one who called out for restoration, may you give them a commitment to the process and fill them with hope. Hope to know that just like you restored David, you will restore them. Now I pray that we would go in the forgiveness, in the peace, and the hope that has been provided by the Holy Spirit. And may He empower you to declare with your life that he, Jesus, has made a difference in you. God bless you.